Yes. Barbara Wilson considered this department her academic home from 1978 until her death. I had the good fortune to be her partner for more than half of her life. And during the 1990s, Margot discovered much of what we know about the spousal homicide, by which phrases and things wondered were encompassing Bengalina you know, lies, the husband, um, whether registered marriage or a fact or common law marriage. What I'm going to talk about today is what is persistent in spousal homicide since Margot did her, I think it is fair to say, seminal work on the subject um, 25 years ago or so, and some things that have changed. And you may take heart from the uh, word encouraging there. But I'm going to talk about Margot a lot. I have a hard time believing that it's actually 10 years since her death. Um, there are a number of people in this room who were very fond of her, who were dear friends. Um, some of them have actually come a long way to be here. And so this is going to be very much a memorial lecture in a way that previous, previous Margot Memorial lectures have not been. And I realize that most of the people in this room are students who never knew Margot. I beg your indulgence. I think you will see data and interesting stuff um, despite the focus on the person. Let's see how shall I. There's Margaret Wilson as a kid um, in the Arctic, about 100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, where she grew up in Fort McPherson with a brother, Tucker Spangle named McGinty. Um, Margaret's mom was the nurse in the Gwich'in community of Fort McPherson. She was the uh, only non-Aboriginal student in a one-room primary school house. Um, and if you're in a one-room primary school house, by the time you're in grade six, your primary job is to teach the grade ones and twos. Um, so this was not an ideal place to complete your education, especially since there was no hospital. So Margot left there to go to high school in Victoria, BC living with what was an effective a foster family and returning to the north to be with her mother in the summers. After completing high school, she entered the University of Alberta and she originally wanted to be a nurse, like her mom, but she bridled at the sexist practices of nursing profession at that time. Um, men were not admitted to studying nursing. Married women were not admitted. If you were discovered to be been secretly married, you were expelled. Um, all the students had to be in their dorm and there was bed check every night and they'd better be alone. Um, and she quit before Christmas and went into psychology. And while in psychology, she got a job in an embryology lab, part-time job in an embryology lab, and her interests turned more physiological. And so by the time she graduated, she wanted to do what we would now call behavioral endocrinology. In those days, people said hormones and behavior. And so she went to the University of California at Davis to do her master's degree, and then University College London to do her PhD, castrating male monkeys, a useful skill. I'm <laughs> and, and doing hormone replacement therapy and seeing what it did to behavior. But Margot completed her PhD in 1972. Her supervisor wanted her to stay on as a badly paid postdoc in the lab for a couple of years, and she um, refused that offer, and he was pissed, and refused to write her any letters for any jobs for him. So she had no sponsor. And in those days, a sponsor was more important than a long publication list, actually. Your PhD supervisor called up people they knew and said, I've got a good student. So Barbara moved to Toronto, got a job as a typist at the Royal Ontario Museum, not mentioning she had a PhD. 
And over the course of the next two years, she wheedled her way into the University of Toronto Psychology Department as what we would now call a session, teaching sort of a course at the time and being paid by the course. Somehow in that period, she managed to get an NRC grant, forerunner of NSERC, um, for monkey research to set up a squirrel monkey lab, um, a squirrel monkey colony and lab at the University of Toronto, all without a real job. And that's when I met her. And we fell together in 1975. And shortly thereafter, I got a job in California. Margot had nothing to stay in Toronto for, really, sort of job security six months at a time. And so she came with me and had a couple of underpaid sessional jobs in California while we were there for three years. We came to McMaster in 1978. Again, I had a job, she did not. And the culture at that time was very opposed to spousal hires. They were felt to be sort of nepotistic and wrong. And so I had a job in this department. Margo was a contributing member of this department, published many papers here, supervised undergraduates, co-supervised all my graduate students. Um, but had no job. She accomplished an enormous amount at this time. I'll tell you about homicide research in a little while. We got a hold of an archive of homicide research in which we were very interested in the determinants of differential sentencing. And Margot said, to really understand what the judicial profession thinks they're doing, I think I better go to law school. So in 1986, the University of Toronto was just starting a new master's in Master of Studies in Law program um, for people with PhDs in social science. It was an insanely intensive one-year program where you took first-year law courses, second-year law courses, third-year law courses, and graduate law courses all in the same year with the law student um, and had to get a piece of it. And uh, Margot broke her ass at that and got the first MSL um, from the University of Toronto. The only student who sat down with that. Um, she got her first, she got her master of studies in law from the University of Toronto in 1987. And while she was here, I was in an academic position, she was a spring of SSHRC grants to study homicide. She was elected president of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. Finally, in 1997, I guess. An eminent member of this department, Shepard Siegel, um, who was the only member of the department who was a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, pleasantly surprised us by nominating both of us for the Royal Society. And we were elected. We were the first couple that were being inducted in simultaneously. And I think somebody in the administration said, you know, we've looked at a handful of FRFC from the university, and one of them is some woman I've never heard of. Um, and they created a position for her, and so for the last 11 years of her life, she was a professor in this department. Margot was full of ideas and enthusiasm, and some of the ideas were pretty zany. Uh, one of the most zany was that we should study Hansa. This didn't come completely out of the blue. We had done some work using archival data to show this. Children living with step parents were at higher risk of child abuse than children living with both their birth parents. And an obvious concern as soon as you get a phenomenon like that is maybe there's a reporting bias or a detection bias that's just not a real difference. But when we look at the lethal cases of child abuse, which should presumably have minimal, if any, reporting and detection biases, you find the differential even larger. And this idea that homicide could be a window on sort of social conflicts and the conflicts characteristic of certain social relationships is something Margaret took on board and said we should study homicide more generally as a way to test relationship specific conflict hypotheses about that. I thought that was pretty zany, but it gets sillier. Um, she said, and we should study it in the city of Detroit. It's just down the road. It's got more homicides every year in the whole of Canada, which was true. Um, they're all investigated by a single police department, so if you can just get in there. 
and into their investigative files, then you can get a lot of data. And so there's the city of Detroit across the river from Green Windsor to the north of Windsor, baffling everybody. Um, and we wrote a letter to the chief of police of Detroit and said, hey, can we come rummage around in your homicide files for research purposes? And we were incredibly lucky. The chief of police, who was sort of a figurehead really to publish things, passed this along to the deputy chief of police who actually ran the place. And that was this guy, James Bannon, he had a PhD in sociology. And he writes us, you know, this is pre-web days, so we write him a letter and put it in Canada Post, he writes the letter back and says, come on down and talk about it. So we went down to Detroit, we met this guy, sort of could tell he was a sympathetical person. I mean, he's a cop and he's got a gun strap here, but he's also got on his desk, a little thing saying, Dr. James Bannon, take two aspirins and see me in the morning. Um, and he sort of got the drift that he was a human being. And also, then when he started complaining about the fact that the police foundation had ripped off some of its data, we thought, this is our kind of person. Um, so, anyway, he introduced us to the head of the homicide division. And there we were, just sort of technical in the investigative files of homicide cases. And they're rich, they're full of information. But I'm talking about spousal homicide. We settled on a one year sample of homicide cases. We settled on 1972, even though this was 1980. We saw all the cases that had happened in 72 that were going to be solved were solved. They'd all been adjudicated to that time, and it seemed like a good one. Um, there were 690 homicides in Detroit in 1972. There were 521 in the whole. Canada that year. Um, all the files were there in this one police department. 512 of these cases have been solved. In 80 cases, the differential of their spouse, whether in a registered marriage or a de facto or common law marriage, 36 men had killed their wives and 44 of them killed their husbands. And I see a couple of them. And yes, yes, that was kind of startling and interesting, and we will come back to the point of what Margot called the sex ratio of spouse killing. Um, I'm going to review a few of Margot's contributions, and then I'm going to uh, tell you what's changed. So one of Margot's contributions was to identify demographic risk factors, like risk in relation to age, in relation to the age disparity of a couple, some other things. At this time, homicide research had been dominated by sociologists who were interested in predicting gross rates of homicide in units like cities or states of the US or countries from gross social indicators from, from those same places. And that's a very worthy and worthwhile enterprise, and I sunk into it myself. At the time, nobody had addressed questions of a role like epidemiologist question. Who's at risk from whom? What's a risk factor to an individual? And so we plunged into that. No one has investigated the effects of age on risk, for example. I had a hypothesis. I thought men value women for their reproductive value. The older women will incur the most risk. Men will be most recklessly disregarding of their well being in a conflict situation or something. I confess I was perhaps unduly influenced by a couple of or three very prominent cases in the news around that time. You may remember the premier of Saskatchewan, Alan Thatcher, who took out a contract on his middle aged wife in order to take up with the younger woman. Um, billionaire developer, Peter Demeter in Toronto, who done exactly the same thing. Um, and actually, there was a guy here in Hamilton who owned a string of funeral parlors who'd done exactly the same thing, and that was in the news too. Um, so, this was my hypothesis. Margaret said, No, you're an idiot. Um, what men are doing is they're using violence, coercion control lies. The lethal violence is the tip of the iceberg of if you like more functional coercive violence. And uh, and it's the young wives that are most concerned to control. Well, whether the reasoning was right on that, um, the prediction was a lot better than mine. Here are 
homicide rates, absorbed signs, by the way, meaning killing twice. So I'll say spousal homicides when I'm talking about either direction, Akazora signs when I'm talking about the killing of wives. Um, here are the killing of wives as a function of the wife's age. Akazora signs permanently in wife's brand or a set of dates in Canada. And I'd just like to do a little shout out actually, the middle author here, Holly Johnson, who was an analyst at Statistics Canada at the time. She subsequently went and got a PhD in sociology and now is a professor at the University of Cape Town. But, uh, but Holly was the person who invented and ran Stats Canada's Violence Against Women survey, which was a model for such surveys and copied um, all over the world. And Margo was very good at forging collaborations with people whose background was different from ours. She certainly wasn't an evolutionary biologist, and she uh, was not a psychologist for that matter. But we got on well and got some interesting comparisons. This paper is actually a comparison of risk factors for it. We stole it from the lethal violence against wives. Now, if you're looking at this, and you know, if I haven't put you to sleep, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, but why should I believe that's an effect of the wife's age? I mean, uh, young women are mostly married to young guys. Young guys are the most dangerous demographic category, you all know that. Um, they, they kill other guys disproportionately, too. So maybe it's really a husband's age. There may be something to that, but at the very least, it's much more complicated than that. And I'll illustrate this by talking about the very youngest category of women who are at the most risk. And what risk are they at as a function of their husband's age? Because some women are married to them much older than that. So killing of young wives by, as a function of the husband's age, there are data for Canada. Um, you marry an old guy? <laughs> Watch your back. Um, and this is one illustration of the fact that age disparity is another risk factor. Now, that's just Canadian data. We managed to assemble um, appropriate data for a couple of other comparisons for New South Wales, Australia, just because we could get the data we needed for these places. And for the whole of England and Wales. And although not as dramatically as in Canada, they tell the same story. Young women are actually more at risk from older husbands than they are from you know, age concordant husbands. So, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, identifying and quantifying demographic risk factors. When we started doing this, no one was doing it. Very soon thereafter, very soon thereafter, the Surgeon General of the U.S., a guy named Deborah Koop, pronounced violence a public health problem and gave a mandate to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta to study violence, which lasted until some Republican administration decided that they shouldn't do that. Um, that wasn't really a public health problem. So actually, we found the epidemiologists very quickly as our best colleagues and used to go to epidemiology meetings. Another really important thing that Margot pioneered was quantification of the elevated risk associated with separation. Everybody in the um, women's shelter movement, um, the battered wives movement, knew that the immediate aftermath of a separation was a really dangerous time. But, you know, nobody had systematically reviewed the literature of all known spousal homicides in various jurisdictions and what proportion of them are strange much less what we should expect. This was our best effort to answer that. We again had the Canadian data, the New South Wales data. Now we've started working in Chicago and Detroit. And uh, we have data for the city of Chicago. This is the likelihood that your husband will risk you, that your husband will kill you if you're co-residing with him. This is the risk that your, your husband will kill you if you left him. Um, and by left, I mean, the denominator here is all women whose official marital status is separated or divorced, which is sort of the best we can do for a denominator, but it doesn't really get at just how bad this contrast is, because that includes people who've been separated for years. Um, but in fact, most of the action happens in a couple of months after separation, and sometimes on the day of. 
Um, so still, this was um, an important first effort of quantifying this sort of thing. And Margaret made a number of other contributions. Um, she headed up a project showing that the United States was uniquely weird in its house towing ratio. That you saw the data from Detroit. In that case, women kill men actually more, their husbands more often than vice versa. This, we could find nowhere else in the world where this was true. And, uh, and tried to analyze some reasons for it in this paper. But this was an important show because the similar numbers of bodies were assumed by some chronologists and family violence researchers to be indicative of equal violence by husbands and wives, which I'll get back to in a minute. Margo also um, headed up a project distinguishing two types of familicides, and by familicides, I mean killing the wife and kids together in a collective event. And the two types were some guys who do this are depressive, and, you know, they often they've lost a well-paid job or something, solid middle-class guys who've got a stay-at-home life, and they're suicidal, and they're going to take the family with them, because after all, how could you leave them behind? Um, and the other category are guys who are accusatory and angry at the woman and her parasitic brood, and um, have and they're never suicidal, essentially. But the common denominator of these two things, when you think about it for a second, is that in both cases, men construed women and children as theirs to be disposed of, as they saw fit. And the concept of male sexual proprietariness, the tendency to treat women as property, um, was something that Margot got very interested in, especially after going to law school and studying the law of property. And, Seeing that how historically much of the law of marital entitlement was derived directly from that, or indeed invoked that very directly. Um, so the idea that men are sexually proprietary animals who, uh, you know, stake out a woman as their property and consider the interest of another male or her interest in another male as a violation of their rights and their ownership rights. Um, was an important idea, and actually, that's the idea that most caught, non-evolution-minded, sociologically trained um, homicide researchers. So, the Journal of Homicide Studies is the principal journal of the society of weird people who study homicides. Um, there is only ever been one memorial issue for a former member of the society who died, and that was for Margot, um, a special issue in honor of Margot in 2012. Uh, I'm sorry if that's not visible. It wasn't immediately meant to be. The, uh, the point is that there was a special issue, and the idea of male sexual proprietary was the thing that seemed to fire up enthusiasm among other researchers with different backgrounds. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about with the first study of postal homicide that was ever conducted in Canada before we started. And that was done by this guy, Peter Chimbos, who was a professor of sociology down the road at what was then the University of Western Ontario, or specifically Brescia College there. He wrote this little monograph called Marital Violence, a Study of Interspose Homicide. It, um, it's a good read to this day because he interviewed these 34 convicted killers of spouses, um, 32 of them all in prison, two of them shortly after they were released. And he, there's a lot of rich stuff in this monograph, but he also did some sort of standardized interview as well and asked people exactly the same question. And one question was, what was the main source of conflict in your marriage? And here's the total distribution of answers as categorized by Chimbos. Sexual matters, 29, excessive drinking, and well, there really wasn't any conflict on that. Um, and that's it, that's the exhaustive list. It's kind of fascinating. I mean, many of these people are not particularly well to do. No one's pointing to financial matters. 
They most of them had children. Nobody's playing the child rearing complex. You know, this is it. And from the interviews, it's very apparent that what sexual matters essentially means in every interview that he quoted at length, which he said were representative of all of them, was that men blamed the killings on their wives' infidelities, and women blamed the killings on their husbands' assaultive accusations of infidelity. But it's the guy in either case who is claiming the partner has been unfaithful, and usually she ended up dead in this example. And sometimes he did. And <coughs> excuse me. Few studies other than this one would show you quite such a predominance of this motive category. But they all show you a predominance. Every study we could find will show you a predominance of it. Quite early in our interest in these topics. Margot and I and a student named Suzanne Leghorst, a student named Suzanne Leghorst, um, wrote a paper on male sexual jealousy where we tried to review all the literature um, on the subject, especially anthropological literature on and particular homicide of spouses. And just confining your attention to thorough samples, like not cherry picked stories, but all the cases that occurred in some city in some year or something like that. Um, we found that. What we call male sexual jealousy, which we broadly implied, defined to encompass both the preoccupation with sexual fertility and also targeted attention points for leaving. Um, we found that accounted for at least 65% of the cases in, in every in the studies we could find, and often more. Um, a sense, you know, maybe, maybe there's other stories to be told, maybe these are um, self serving after the fact stories or something, but. Uh, this was the case in a large majority everywhere. And then, as I said, Marco um, wanted to take this idea and slightly rethink it in what she called male sexual proprietariness, the tendency to treat women as property. And particularly in a re review chapter, um, we summarized this in connection with legal history and so on. Um, and this was sort of supposed to be a playful allusion to the recently popular um, Oliver Sacks essay, The Man Who Mistook His Way for a Hat, um, The Man Who Mistook His Way for a Channel. Now, there's a distraction. Male, male. Um, this idea that, in fact, marital violence is a two way street. You know, there are people who would write. The problem isn't violent men, it's violent couples. Um, and the principal perpetrator of this idea was a guy named Murray Strauss. Um, and Murray headed up a family violence research institute at the University of New Hampshire. He had a large number of students, and probably most of the people working on family violence in academic settings in the United States in the 80s and 90s and 2000s had gone through Murray's um, Institute. And he invented something called the Conflict Tactics Scales in collaboration with his colleague Richard Gellies in particular. They were concerned with the sort of subjectivity of words like violence and so on. And they thought they could solve this problem by asking people very behavioral questions. Have you pushed your spouse in the last year? Have you slapped your spouse in the last year? Have you threatened your spouse with a weapon in the last year, etc.? Um, and the finding from such studies, national probability sample surveys in the United States in 1975 and 1985, um, Strauss and Gelly summed up like this. Within the family or in dating and co-having relationships, women are going to One of the students, Suzanne Steinmetz, went so far as to Proclaim the existence of a battered husband syndrome. Now, this there was the phrase battered wife syndrome, which Lenore Walker had popularized. Um, it's gone out of fashion because I think most um, people studying these things and feminists and the shelter movement and so on thought it had a tone of victim blaming. You know, she's got a syndrome, or at least, you know, pathologizing 
the victims of violence by saying they have a syndrome. But at the time, people talked about battered wife syndrome. And Susanna proposed that there's just as many battered husbands out there as battered wives, but we just don't see them because they're too ashamed to admit. And they have their survey. And they have the equal body counts in the US. Um, also homicide. Here's an exemplary kind of quote that you would see in the literature in those days, and in fact, still will. Um, women are more prone than men to engage in severely violent acts. Each year, more men than women are victimized by their enemies. And of course, as in all Americocentric sociology and criminology, they're actually the problem with the US. But that's okay. The conflict tactic skill studies have been done in many countries, including Canada and elsewhere. And it's true, they consistently turn up Murray's results. Well, we used to hear Murray and his students, we, we go to their paper sessions at the American Society of Criminology, and they drive us crazy and we ask um, pointed questions. And a couple other people who did the same are these two, um, Rebecca and Russell Dobash, who are the authors of a classic work called Violence Against Wives, a case against the patriarchy. I'm not always fond of the way people toss the word patriarchy around. I think they tossed it around quite appropriately, actually. I could talk about that some more later. But uh, Russell and Becky were criminologists in the UK. They were heavily involved with the women's movement, with the establishment of um, shelters for abused women. They were kind of heroes to component of the women's movement at the time. And they sit in this audience and fulminate. Um, and ask quite questions too. So, well, there's nothing like a common enemy to make friends. Um, and even though their backgrounds were very different stars, Margot says, I forget, said, I forgot this, because when we first met them, Russell and Becky referred to us as positivists. And we didn't realize that was an insult. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we sort of became buddies because we were driven nuts by the same stuff and we're converging on the same complaints about it. Um, so there's the four of us, Russell, Rebecca, Margo with no sunglasses for a year, and me um, at a criminology meeting in New Orleans in 1992. And we got together and tried to refute this. And I think we did so very successfully. In fact, I think we devastated it all over people who don't believe that. Um, in this paper, a paper that was called The Myth of Sexual Symmetry and Marital Violence, we pointed out a couple of things, a few things. Um, the most important of which in the present context are that those public tactic scale measures have zilch reliability. In studies in which people have separately asked husbands and wives, both the perpetrator and the victim, forms of these questions, there's like no concordance. There was one study where there was negative concordance. There were men who claimed to have beaten their wives. There were women who claimed to have been beaten. There were women who claimed to have beaten their husbands. There were men who claimed to have been beaten. And there wasn't a single case in which there was a claim of perpetration and a claim of victimization by the spouse. I mean, these measures are crud. They, 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 they treating them as valid because they're more behavioristic. It's like still self-report. And there's a massive amount of reason to suppose that self-report data are particularly vulnerable to problems in the domains of violence and sexual behavior, but probably violence even more than sexual behavior. Um, and, you know, there's no reason to believe them. They, they had no inter- observer or interparticipant reliability because they can't have validity. Reliability is a sine qua non for some validity. Anyway, we point out this out and at the same time we step up with the uniqueness and the peculiarity of American homicide data. One reason we start the claim starts to drop away was this ain't so symmetrical. In the Detroit data I showed you on the first slide with the numbers on it and in other studies, about three quarters of all women who killed their husbands were not charged with a crime. And essentially, no men who killed their wives were not charged with a crime, except for those who committed suicide. Um, and the reason they're not charged with a crime is because they can provide evidence of previous hospital admissions for being abused by the guy, 
or there's a plausible self-defense story that the jury is going to buy. And busy prosecutors aren't going to bother trying to prosecute or aren't even they're even actually genuinely sympathetic. So that numerical balance was very misleading. One more little intangent about an empirical phenomenon. And I mentioned at the beginning was stepchildren being a successful risk compared to children living with both birth parents. It occurred to us that, well, that should mean that women with children from former unions may also be an allocated risk. Stepchildren are a source of conflict, whether because the woman wants more invested in her kid than the guy is inclined to do, or whatever they're arguing about. Um, if that's a source of conflict, you may expect that. Um, having stepchildren in the home would be one as well. We first tried to tackle this question. There were no suitable data sets. Things like the big stats Canada data included all homicide. So you couldn't find out people's reproductive histories or household compositions. So we set about doing it here in Hamilton because every spousal homicide, I mean, you can find every spousal homicide in the stats Canada data and confirm that they were all reported in the Hamilton Spectator, um, that there were accounts of the cases and information and possibly information to get at a trial that came to trial. And it took us a long time to accumulate much data because there's only about 1.5 spousal homicides per annum in Hamilton. Thank you. Um, but here are the results of accumulating data on this question for 22 years. Um, what is the probability or the, or the incidence of being killed by your partner? This is just Women who have minor children in the home and the partner in the home. So they're the only ones we're considering. So how those women might be killed by their husbands, they're not included. If the children are all sired by the current current partner, there's a certain risk of being killed. If you have at least one by the current partner and at least one by a former partner, that jumps up. And if you have children only by a former partner, it jumps up a lot more. And this has since been replicated in the US and elsewhere. Um, but it was the first demonstration of this phenomenon. And it turns out to be interesting in another context, which I'm going to turn my attention to now. And that is this. Here's a wicked problem, as I say nowadays. Um, predicting lethality in abusive relationships. There's been a lot of interest in this problem because you know, there's no sense wagging your finger at women who are abused and go back to their abusers. If you, you want to be helpful, do things like present them with information and, and, and inform their decision. Um, and why it's a wicked problem is the same risk factors for non-lethal and lethal violence. Stepkids, female youth, de facto union. You know, surveys tell you that these are all risk factors for non-lethal violence. They're also risk factors for lethal violence. Women who tackled this question first and still is in some ways is Jackie Campbell, who is a nurse on faculty, faculty of nursing at Johns Hopkins University. And she set up a very effortful sort of match case um, study of what are the attributes of women who are killed by their husbands, what are the attributes of women who have been abused by their husbands who are matched in some way um, in US cities. And she found three things that are predictive of lethality in abusive relationships. The first was if there is a gun in the home, you know, the woman's beaten, but if there's a gun in the home, she's more likely to be killed. If they have a history of separations, which is an interesting one, separating, reconciling, separating, reconciling, don't do it. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a risk circumstance for violence, and it's over and above that, a big risk factor for lethal violence. And the third one, which again is a risk factor for violence, but a bigger risk factor for lethal violence, was her child, his stepchild in the home. Now, actually, there were a couple other things that were aspects of the abuse itself, which were also predictors. Having choked her in the past episode. Um, but uh, Jackie included this because we were talking at the Violence Against Women sessions at the American Society of Criminologists. And convinced her that, uh, that this should be added as a predictor. <laughs> okay, pretty um, grim news so far. So I want to give you some good news. Here are data 
on rates of social homicide in Canada for the last 40 years, over a 40 year period. Female victims in red, male victims in blue, victims per million, persons at risk per annum. We're including both registered and de facto unions. And it's stunningly down. I mean, the, the trend downward is quite, quite striking. The women are being killed around 2015, a, a third the rate they were 40 years earlier. And the men are being, the men it's an even bigger proportion. And they seem not to be a risk at all, hardly. If you look at the US, you see something similar, but interestingly different. Here for US data, and here I've used into partner homicides because I protect the whole region about you know, what's available in FBI data and whether it's any good. Um, these, so this includes boyfriend, girlfriend, and also the denominator is just out um, of each sex. But uh, you've got a long downward trend, most dramatically in the males. And the consequence is that back there in 1970, in the mid-70s, women were about as much as likely to kill their husbands as vice versa in the US. I used the past tense when I mentioned that fact earlier because it ain't true no more. The US has become a normal country in this one regard. Um, how come? Well, one thing that's really nice about the US is they're divided up into 50 states and other kinds of units, and they implement policies and things asynchronously. So if you can figure out how to do the analytic methods right, you can ask questions about what's affecting something by comparing when, what, how many shelters per million women were available in these cities at the first time. Um, when did they institute mandatory arrest of abusers? Because it used to be the case that if, you know, the police are called into a domestic, as they say, um, they'd ask the woman, do you want me to arrest them? And like, You know, she's got to live with this guy in the future, what does she say? Um, but mandatory arrest, we don't care what she wants, we're arresting him if there's evidence of violence. This was instituted in a number of places. And there's decent evidence that a lot of this drop is due to the implementation of these resources for abused women. Probably the best paper on this topic is this one which appeared in a journal called Feminist Criminology a few years ago. Um, if you are perhaps like me, inclined to suspect a priori that a journal called Feminist Criminology is going to be more rhetoric than data, read the paper, it's good. Um, and what's interesting is what they've shown is that domestic violence resources clearly protect men, less clearly and probably less dramatically protect women. I mean, that's a bit of a head scratcher, except when you think about it, there's some sense to it. Because the women who killed their husbands were typically victims of abuse, acting after a long period of abuse, arguably in self defense. Well, there's an alternative to stabbing the bastard if, if there's a women's shelter. Um, there, there are other ways out. And so the irony seems to be that if you implement these resources for abused women, you actually save more male lives than female lives. But you say both, um, which is interesting. I think I've got time to do the next three slides. I wasn't sure I would. Um, I've been living in New Zealand for the last few months, and I've been getting into New Zealand homicide archives. Turns out there's a homicide archive maintained by a news organization with, with the name Stuff, which doesn't sound promising because it's all going to be clickbait or something, but actually they're a very respectable news collection agency, and they put together a file of all the cases. They're actually modeled it on something that the LA Times does now, if you want to look at homicide cases in LA, individual cases are all online with details. So, Stuff's put together this homicide archive. It only goes back to 2004, and because New Zealand's a small country, I mean, I think they just popped 10 million population. Um, I've sort of reduced a bit of the jitter here by lumping these into three year categories. It looks like something similar may be going on in New Zealand, that there is a decline 
at least in state of victimization rate, that they too are enjoying a reduction in uh, disposal homicide or intimate partner homicide. There's a lot of things about homicide in New Zealand that look just like what we're used to in North America. About 117 abzoricides in New Zealand in this sample. Um, male sexual proprietariness is a dominant motive or trigger in at least 65% of these cases. And there's enough of them that we actually don't know much about that it's almost a point higher. Estranged women are at the greatest risk. 41% of the victims have left their killers, and another 4% were in the process of doing something. And essentially, half the women. Now, I don't have any relevant population of large data to compute rates. This is clearly more than you would expect by check. The risk is high at and right after separation. Some of these cases are on the day of, some more are in the week after. Stalking is prevalent. I mentioned stalking. At least 15% of the victims here, the women who are killed by the husband, have taken out a protection order against them. Um, and, you know, that's a piece of paper. Um, it doesn't do a lot for them, necessarily. And I haven't mentioned overkill either. Um, a lot of an overkill means administering conspicuously more damage than would have been necessary to kill the person. I stabbed her 207 times, um, or, you know, broke 38 bones and beating her to death with a baseball bat or something. Um, overkill is prevalent, as it is in spousal homicides elsewhere. Men are angry. Suicide is prevalent. 21% of the killers had committed suicide as men have killed. And this is like essentially the only category of homicide that the killers commit suicide. At the sooner and sooner immediately afterward, except for depressed mothers killing children after their infants. Um, they also are suicidal. But otherwise, any category of homicide you can take up. Suicide is pretty rare. But here we've got 30% of the guys tried it. The botched attempts, you know, can't just say it was eight or something. I mean, guy shot himself in the head and didn't manage to kill himself, you know, things like this. Um, Younger wives are at the greater risk. I'll show you data on all of this. Maybe less dramatic than in North America. Age disparity is almost certainly a risk marker. 24% of the couples were at least 10 years apart in age. Again, I don't have the relevant population of large data yet, but I'm sure that's got to be um, a larger proportion than in couples generally. At least 42% of these 117 victims had a child side by a previous partner. Um, which is again, you know, I don't have a relevant population of this is a lot of cases. And again, the at least means there may be more. Um, and actually, this and child victimization data both suggest that New Zealand shows a bigger difference between step families and genetic families than we see in North America um, in terms of risk to both the woman and the kids. And they thought your marriage is a risk marker. 62% of the victims were in cotton water de facto unions compared to 22% of couples in the population at large. So if you do this sort of ratios in your head, that comes up to about a sixfold greater risk um, to women in de facto unions than registered unions. And that's exactly what we initially found in Canada, sixfold excess risk. But there's an interesting story about change there, too. Some of you will remember Bridie James, although you may not recognize her. Um, Bridie said, I sure anybody here who knows her that, uh, that they shouldn't be alarmed by the short hair. She just got tired of expensive haircuts and being hot in the summer in Brisbane, Australia, where she lives. Um, Bridie did her master's thesis in this department a number of years ago, and she discovered demonstrated an interesting phenomenon that nobody had known about. Um, there used to be excess, so cohabiting was the same as what I called it, de facto. So the top two, the squares, if you can see that that's what they are, are cohabiting women and cohabiting men. The bottom two are, or, or the circles, are registered marriage women and registered marriage 
demand. Um, over this period from 1990 to 2005, what's remarkable is the difference has disappeared. The excess risk in de facto relationship has disappeared from being like a six-fold difference to nothing in the sort of steady process. And also, most of the reduction in disposable homicide, in most of the action seems to be de facto I mean. um, Variety tested a lot of hypotheses. And the first thing that springs to mind is, well, de facto unions are normalized and legitimized to the degree now that they were in the past. Maybe they're just more like registered marriages. Maybe they're less different. But at least in terms of income, education level, age distribution, the differences are exactly the same at the end of this period as they were at the beginning between registered and de facto unions. So it ain't that. Um, what is it is interesting. Bridie also unpublished, but in her master's thesis, produced similar data for Canada. And she didn't publish it because she wasn't sure of the reliability of some things. And the data are a little noisier, but they seem to be telling much the same story. Um, a convergence of de facto versus registered marriages. So that the difference has largely disappeared. And perhaps even more dramatically, here than in the US, there's really not much trend in the uh, registered marriages, although this actually does amount to something to drop the males down to essentially nothing. Um, the trend, the action seems to be mostly on a de facto union. Well, these are things for you to think about. What the hell does that mean? Um, what explains these declines in social homicide rates, these differential declines in social homicide rates? I think. A large part of the answer must be the shrinking legitimacy of male sexual proprietor. Now, it may sound funny for a guy who has sort of been arguing that male sexual proprietariness is a cross cultural universal and all that um, to say this, but that doesn't mean that men act on these things in a the vacuum. There are societal supports for men to feel entitled. To control their wives. Um, when do you think men lost the entitlement in the UK to forceful, forcibly to confine a wife who wanted to leave them? It was after Russell and Becky started their work in Scotland. Um, it was 1973. The uh, I remember, I'm an old guy, I remember when I was a kid. Nice white collar men making disparaging jokes about women and thinking that was sort of a funny thing to do. And I can certainly remember hearing not so much from the nice white collar men, the sort of bragging to each other about how they had to give their wife a smack in order to get her into line or something like that. I think the universe within which you can brag about that kind of shit has just shrunk. There's fewer and fewer guys who think this is something be proud of a normal one to chuckle about. And when I say legitimacy matters, it's partly that if you spend any time rummaging around in homicide files, you discover that most homicide offenders think they're moral agents. They think they're acting righteously, but they, you know, the victims have done wrong and deserve their fate. And especially in marital homicide. Um, these guys aren't just, you know, just a bunch of hamadryas baboons or something. They're, they're, they're morally indignant about something. And then if the social framework that supports moral indignation over things like women wanting to control their own lives starts to fall away, then I think the self-entitlement and indignation to, to Behave by all they fall away. You know, if Margot Wilson were still among us, I'm sure she'd, I'm sure she'd have lots of ideas about these questions. I suspect she'd even have some zany ideas about how we can test them. But um, alas, she no longer does walk among us. Thank you.